My name is Bob Child. I'm the founder and president of Child Group Wealth Management in Boca Raton, Florida, and a proud supporter of FDD. FDD's Policy Summit provides an opportunity for us to reflect on the past year's national security developments and engage in important conversations about decisions of the years to come. The past two years have been marked by a seismic shift in the Arab world from Egypt to Libya. Many of the regimes that have ruled the Middle East and Africa for decades have fallen, and the new order is beginning to take shape. Though that shape remains far from clear, popular Islamist movements like the Muslim Brotherhood have already risen in prominent in Egypt, and it appears likely that they will rise in Jordan and other countries across the region. Our theme of this session centers on the very questions, Islamists and elections, and where do they lead? I am pleased to introduce our panelists, Raoul Mark uh, correct, is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and a former longtime CIA operative in the Middle East. Uh, correct is an authored several books, including the, Ma the Wave Man, God in the Ballot Box in the Middle East. Brian Katulis is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, before which he spent years in Jordan, the Palestinian, ter excuse me, the Palestinian territories, and Egypt, initially as a Fulbright scholar and later with the National Democratic Institute. Rob Satloff is executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. In the years after September 11th attack, he and his family moved to Rabid, Morocco, from which he had traveled widely across the Arab world, writing on the challenges of Islamic radicalism. Uh, Brett Stevens is global columnist at the Wall Street Journal and a deputy director, and excuse me, directly editor of the editorial page before rejoining the journal. He served as the top editor of the Jerusalem Post and manages his news and editorial coverage. Our moderator today will be Jonathan Shanzer, FDD's vice president of research, who worked previously at the Middle East intelligence analyst and terrorism finance specialist at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Shanzer has, been, has authored several studies of our political sentiment using social media to understand nascent forms of political expression under repressive regimes. I have no doubt our panelists will lead an enlightening debate. I thank our distinguished experts for joining us today and ask you to join us in welcoming, welcoming them for FDD's Washington Forum. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bob, for that introduction, and, and thank you, um, uh, all of you, for, uh, for, for coming out early this morning for what I think will be a very lively debate. We're going to, uh, we're going to be a uh, asking the question, uh, if democracy is to triumph in the Middle East, Islamist victories at the ballot box are, un are unavoidable or and essential. Uh, this is the motion uh, that we will be debating in the Intelligence Squared format uh, per uh, request from uh, Ruel and Brian, who've uh, done this once already um, to, uh, they're going to try to, uh, they've had a, a practice round. Uh, Rob and Brett have not had a chance of doing this, but uh, I suspect have probably had several scotches and uh, talked about ways to defeat their foes today. Um, let me just set the scene for a moment. As we all know, of course, uh, this is a time of revolution in the Middle East. It started with a, uh, a fruit seller in Tunisia who uh, self-immolated. Uh, that sparked a full revolution in Tunisia that toppled a 30-year dictator that spread to Egypt. Uh, and, of course, uh, the Egyptian revolution was of particular concern to the United States. Egypt is a, uh, has, has long held uh, incredible importance to U.S. policy in the Middle East. The U.S. Uh, reaction to that revolution uh, was uh, um, unclear. Uh, there were some, of course, who said that this was a good thing, that this would only lead to democracy. Uh, there were others who insisted that uh, Hosni Mubarak was uh, not a dictator which I think actually might be an insult to dictators if the guy spent 30 years uh, um, uh, securing that grip on power. Uh, the, uh, 
the revolution in Egypt has taken many turns. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has come to power through the ballot box. Uh, but that it has been marred uh, of late thanks to edicts issued by Mohamed Morsi, the, uh, the president of Egypt, earning him the moniker on Twitter of Morsellini, uh, uh, or Mubarak with a beard. Um, and uh, now as we look around, we're not sure where this Egyptian revolution is going, uh, and nor are we sure where some of these other revolutions are going around the region. Uh, Syria is teetering. Jordan is burning, and uh, the future uh, is yet to be written. The question now is, in all of these countries, will there be elections? Will Islamists win? Will it be one man, one vote? Or will it be one man, one vote, one time? So with that, we are going to debate the motion, if democracy is to triumph in the Middle East, Islamist victories at the ballot box are unavoidable and essential. Uh, we will have five minutes of opening remarks from each of our panelists today. We will start with Ruel, then go to Rob, then to Brian, then to Brett. From there, we will have uh, some Q&A from myself as well as from the audience, and then our panelists will be allowed two minutes at the end to uh, restate their case and uh, potentially persuade you um, to believing what they believe. So we'll start now with Ruel. Ruel, you may begin. I can do the podium. Uh, this thing's at such an angle, I don't think I can drink. Ruel, I'm confident you will find a way to drink. <laughs> I want to thank everybody uh, for coming, and particularly I want to thank uh, my uh, co-panelists here. Uh, Rob Satloff and I have been debating this issue for almost a decade. Uh, and certainly with Brett, I can say that I don't think I've ever disagreed with Brett except uh, on this issue. And I particularly have to thank my debating colleague, Brian Katulis from the Center of American Progress. It does show that left and right can come together on certain issues. And it's particularly brave for him to be with me because on occasion I have looked at the website at CAP <laughs> and I am sometimes found there depicted as the son of Satan. So uh, I'm not sure what that makes Brian. Uh, but um, I will just say, I mean, let's just be frank. What we're really talking about here is do you prefer dictatorship uh, to democracy? Because that's what the resolution really is. Because we know that if you actually have a free vote, uh, right now Islamists are always going to do well and they're probably going to triumph. That may not be the case down the road, but right now, if you have a free vote, they will triumph. Now, that certainly, in my mind, makes them both unavoidable and essential, because if you believe you, you're going to have to go down that path, some have some non-dictatorial path, then you're going to have to open up the road, and you're going to have to open up the option of them triumphing. Now, what the op opposing side is really saying, I think, is, you know, what we really wanted to have, and it may be too late now, but they really still want it, is they want to have Kamalism. You know, that's what everybody really believed in in Middle Eastern studies, is that you were going to have the model of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, and that you were going to have enlightened despotism, that is, the authoritarianism, authoritarianism that grew out of the fascist Young Turk movement in Turkey in the late Ottoman Empire, that they were going to establish an enlightened despotism, and you were going to create a new liberalism that eventually would become democratic in the Middle East. And that you would take the Sharia, and you would take the faithful, and you would take the ulama, and you more or less cast them off and replace them with Swiss legal codes. And at the end of this long process, Muslims would be basically us. Well, you know, that one, let's look at Turkey. That hasn't exactly turned out so well. Uh, what happened is that as soon as the Turkish military allowed a free vote, Islamic history came roaring back. You don't get to cut off 600 years of Islamic history and create little Swiss men in Anatolia. And that the, uh, the Justice and Development Party, the AKP, has come back and come back rather powerfully, uh, and they have won at the ballot box now repeatedly with a free vote. Now, in the future, that may not be the case, 
But we know that if democracy is to have a chance in Turkey, the Justice and Development Party is going to be there, or their successors will be there. And that we know that also, now that's the most liberal model. In the Arab world, where they, we hope that Kemalism would come about, that you would have dictatorship, you'd have the Mubaraks, and you'd have the kings who we liked, that at the end of that process, you would still also have liberal sides. We didn't, didn't even get close to that. What happened in the Arab world is that dictatorship produced societies where fundamentalism has become the number one dominant intellectual force. It, what happened in the Arab world is they produced societies that gave us al-Qaeda. That's what happens down the dictatorial path. Now, it is absolutely certain that we don't know where uh, the Islamism, the fundamentalism is going to head uh, in the Middle East. But we should have the decency to actually reflect on our own history and to realize that we shouldn't say to them what Westerners themselves didn't live up to. You can't expect them to be better than we were. And if you think about how long it took for us to get where we are today, then we should have, we must have a bit more patience for them. Hey, thank you, Ruel. Uh, now, Rob Satloff. Uh, thank you to FTD. It's a pleasure to be here to join my panelist, Brett, against these, these two very courageous opponents of ours. After, um, after Jim Woolsey's opening comments that essentially put their side of the argument um, on the side of uh, Hitler, Stalin, and um, uh, Khomeini, uh, the fact that they're even sitting up here is remarkably courageous. The resolution, uh, if democracy is to triumph in the Middle East, Islamist victories at the ballot box are unavoidable and essential. I and Brett oppose both parts of this resolution. Islamist victory is neither inevitable nor welcome, as the resolution suggests. First, inevitable. Just look at elections throughout the region. Historically, Islamists rarely get more than a third of the vote. They don't win. Non-Islamists lose. Non-Islamists tend to divide among themselves. It is not that Islamists get more than 50%. They don't. The non-Islamists collectively get the more than 50%. The Islamists get less. The divisions among the non-Islamists are what matters. Look at Egypt. Look at Egypt. Five elections in the last two years. Parliamentary, referenda, presidential. Since the fall of Mubarak, non-Islamists got increasingly more votes in every single election until the presidential election, when, with a candidate so tarred by the fact that he was Mubarak's alter ego, they still got 48.5% of the vote. Imagine if they actually had a real independent candidate. They would have won. The numbers clearly support the case that Islamist victories are not inevitable as the uh, resolution, unavoidable as the resolution suggests. Secondly, the more pernicious part of the argument, that they are essential, or the idea that it's in fact good, positive, beneficial for these guys, the Islamists, to win. Some, like Ruel, even say that in order to fight al-Qaeda, we need, to, in, we need to help the Islamists to win. That in fact, they will siphon off or absorb the Islamist tendencies and dry up support for the true violent radicals. This, in my view, is a fundamental misreading of the Islamist project. Islamism is an ideology, an ideology we should respect with seriousness and respect. I define it as the pursuit of political power with the aim of establishing regimes based on Sharia law. It is, by its very nature, anti-West, anti-democratic, anti-liberal, and anti-peace. Its interests are inimical to ours. This is Islamism. It is the opposite of democracy. Democracy is, the people are the source of legitimacy. P 
periodic elections to choose one's representatives. The idea that the political minority can eventually become the majority. Respect for certain rights. Protection for the rights of religious and ethnic minorities. Protection that goes beyond tolerance. And of course, the rule of law. The respect for a judiciary that is independent. Today's debate is very simple. Again, we're not asking whether Muslims can be good Muslims and good Democrats. The answer to that is an emphatic yes. But can Islamists be Democrats? Is it essential that they win? Can advocates of the ideology of Islamism, while retaining fidelity to that ideology, lead their countries to democracy? The answer is an obvious no. My answer, Brett's answer and mine, are grounded in experience and fact. Ruel and Brian's answer is grounded in hope and assertion. We have experiences. Iran, Gaza, Sudan, Lebanon, Turkey, and none of these countries have all the attributes of democracy occurred when Islamists were in power. No rotations in power in any of them. Rights are recognized only in some of them, to varying degree. In some of them, no free and open elections have occurred, and some people are not even recognized as the sources of authority. Are Islamists necessarily terrorists? Absolutely not. But will Islamism ever surrender power if it loses elections? We simply don't know. And if we cannot be confident about that fundamental fact, then how can we be confident that their election is essential for democracy? It hasn't happened. We have no idea whether the first set of elections in Egypt in 7,000 years is in fact the last set of elections. So let me just quote one final citation in closing from the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood's website before they realized that everyone was reading it and instead learned the art of Western PR. Quote, quote, if democracy means that people decide who leads them, then we accept it. If it means that people can change the laws of Allah and follow what they wish to follow, then it is not acceptable. That's the, uh, that's the heart of the story, and it is not the path to democracy. Thank you. Hey, well, it's getting a little feisty here. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's uh, bring up uh, Brian Katulis. Great. Thanks. It's really great to be here, and um, I love the spirit and the feistiness of this. Um, I'm probably going to bring it back a notch. My style is slightly different, and I just want to stress three points here in this debate. And I, I think a big part of this, uh, the definitional aspect of what is Islamism, what are we talking about, who's winning how much. Uh, pay attention to those sorts of details because I think it's essential. I just want to make three points, two of them to the motion, and third, one more about policy, which I hope we'll get into. I know the conference will get into, but U.S. policy and what we can do. Number one, I think the question of Islam and democracy and whether it's compatible, uh, which is not what we're debating here, is the persistent sort of uh, charm of an irrelevant question. I think we see experiences demonstrated around the world, and Rob just mentioned this as well, that you have uh, uh, many Muslim majority countries, including the largest, Indonesia, in which uh, Muslims participate in democracy. You have Islamist political parties participate within that system. So I think when we have discussions, especially these days, given the turmoil in the Middle East, we're often narrowly focused on the 20% of the Muslim world, and six in 10 uh, of Muslims live in the Asia Pacific region and we need to keep their experiences in mind and think about the depth of, of their experiences and uh, but the main point which I think we all agree on is that there's nothing inherently anti-democratic about Islam um, uh, in terms of political culture anything more than Christianity or Judaism or Confucianism uh, so I think we essentially agree with that point second um, and this is where we disagree is that given uh, the, the, the Middle East, which I think what we're going to focus on today, the crushing social, demographic, economic, political pressures these societies are facing, change is coming. And I've lived in this part of the world uh, for five years, back in the 1990s. I go back regularly. And I support the motion as it's currently crafted, in part because I, I think it's like debating gravity. You see sort of the early results in some, uh, most, but not all, if you look at Libya, uh, of the early elections here. Uh, to me, it seemed like a necessary first stage uh, of, of this debate, which we're seeing unfold in Egypt. And it's quite complicated. And yes, Islamist political forces, some of them, but not all of them, will try to set the table, try to limit 
public debate and open debate, and they'll try to impose uh, a model uh, uh, that, that closes off pluralism. But I, I don't see this in Egypt today as a realistic possibility. As we sit here today, this clash is spilling over into the streets, but it's also largely been in politics and in the judiciary. So I think there's this desire for pluralism and that political Islamist forces I think quite naturally in this early stage will be part of that, whether they'll uh, win majorities or not. Uh, but the main point is that I think it, it is necessary uh, and the question of uh, avoiding it, I don't know. Um, the third point I'd want to stress uh, towards the debate is that I, I do believe that political Islamist forces will be forced to change and adapt uh, both their ideology and policies. And this is perhaps the leap of faith, but I think it's the, my belief in democratic systems and freedom. Um, in a sense, that the open debate and pluralism will uh, require Islamists, when exposed to the public as opposed to the dark corners of the mosque, to pay the price, the heavy price of governing. And we'll see this in Egypt, we see it already, in terms of cr creating jobs and other things. Much in the same way that I think in the next couple of weeks in this town, we'll see, see some ideologues, uh, see their, uh, their, their ideology tested. Uh, Nor Nor Grover Norquest and some I thought he was talking about the Democrats there. By the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, with both ways. But that's the main point, is that political forces, wherever their ideology is grounded, as long as the system remains open, and that's what I think we should talk about, is how to do that, as long as it remains pluralistic, I think we'll be forced, and we've seen this in Indonesia. In 2002, the Islamist uh, part, and this is the largest Muslim country in the world, the Islamist parties in 2002 got about 41% of the vote, not a majority. But they've declined over the last couple of years to about 29%. We need to keep these wider examples in focus when we talk about what's coming ahead in the Middle East because I believe we're in the early, early stages of transformations in the Middle East and we'll talk about that complex competition for power. A final point, and it wasn't in towards the debate, but I, I hope we debate it a little bit. I, you're certainly going to talk about it later today. It's the issue of U.S. policy. And it's my view that two years into this uh, transition in the Middle East, and I, I avoid calling it Arab awakenings or Arab Spring. I think it's still too early to characterize it, and I'm worried. You know, we've only seen about uh, four countries see their leadership change and, and two others. It's very, very early. But the U.S. at this stage, and I hope this forum today, this debate, but also the forum later today, talks about how we actually adapt and become more nimble uh, to these events, both in terms of how we deal with political Islam and all other actors. We need to figure out how to most judiciously engage and offer support to, I think, a key factor, which we'll talk about here, are those non-Islamist forces, as Rob pointed out. If you look at the most recent election results in Egypt, there's a d desire and a hunger for diversity. That includes Islamist political forces, but also non-Islamist. And I would argue today that our government and also our non-governmental organizations, and I think FDD and some of the people in the, uh, people in the room right now, we are not well poised. We're, we, we don't have actually the capacity to deal with this, and we can talk about this. But this is where we've got the strongest military in the world. We've got unrivaled intelligence capabilities. We sometimes screw that up, as, as Benghazi, um, uh, the, the case in Benghazi demonstrates. But the biggest policy question for us, which I hope we debate, is how we actually uh, become more nimble and understand the political trends in these societies. Thanks. OK, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Uh, Brett, you're up. Don't be kind. <laughs> I will be kind. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be here, and I'm particularly honored to be on a panel um, introduced by Jim Wolsey, someone I've just uh, the greatest admiration for, and uh, to be with, with this um, mostly distinguished panel. Um, <laughs> uh, the exception, of course, is Ruel. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, the uh, Austrian physicist um, Wolfgang Pauli used to put down uh, his worst students by saying, you're not even wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. And um, that's how I'm inclined to take uh, uh, particularly Ruel's comments. I'll spare you, because uh, we don't know each other well yet, Brian. Um, uh, you know, if I say to my son, what's uh, 5 plus 7, and he says 11, well, that's wrong. Um, if he says banana, then <laughs> he's, he's not even, even wrong. Well, what you've just heard from, from Ruel, especially, is banana. 
This is the argument, okay? Because what he has just essentially done in a very slippery and disingenuous way is say that the choice that we face is between secular dictatorship of the Mubarak stripe or maybe, you know, various other stripes, even perhaps Assad, and democracy, okay? And so we have to accept this democracy because even if it's an Islamist democracy, it's a kind of democracy. Now, if you cast your mind back to January of 2011, when this whole business began, or maybe December of 2010 with uh, uh, Tunisia, um, you could have made an argument which was, would have turned out to be wrong, okay, based on the following things. First of all, that the people who were filling the square in Tahrir were these marvelous characters like, well, Gonem and, you know, Google executives, and they were on their Blackberries and whatever, and they were all socially networked, and they were progressives. And, you know, you, if you were busy reading papers that weren't the Wall Street Journal, uh, you had d pundits saying, the Islamists are late to this party. This, is, this, this whole process is being driven by young progressives who want a you know, more moderate, tolerant, progressive, democratic future in the sense of democracy as we really mean it, which is to say liberal democracy, okay? Uh, I, I didn't see it that way and wrote as much at the time. And, and lo and behold, just like the Bolsheviks uh, overtook the Mensheviks and uh, Robespierre overtook uh, Lafayette, um, you began to see the Muslim Brotherhood come in. Then, the Brotherhood offered this promise that it was not going to contest the presidential election. You remember this promise? They said, we will not contest the presidential election. Well, you already knew that things were going in a very bad way when, as soon as they saw the opportunity, uh, they broke the promise. Then we had the election, and by the way, here I um, uh, very politely disagree with uh, Rob Satloff, for whom I, I have real respect. Um, in that I, I, I think he's somewhat Unlike underest you. <laughs> just to be sure. Somewhat underestimates, or actually dramatically underestimates, the strength of Islamist political parties throughout the entire uh, Middle East. I mean, if the resolution is that if we're going to go through this process, uh, victory of Islamist parties is inevitable, I think the evidence is that, in fact, uh, it is. Uh, I agree with him. Uh, uh, it is inevitable. Um, and so then we, we move along, we have the election, <coughs> and people say, well, you see, the Islamists have won, but Mohammed Morsi is this sort of little non-entity of a character. No one takes him seriously. And by the way, holding the real reins of power is the army. Tantawi is the guy who's in charge of what's going on. And then, boom, Morsi defenestrates Tantawi and the rest of the, uh, of, of the chiefs of staff. But we're still ostensibly wandering our way towards this democratic uh, La La Land future uh, from, from our friends uh, uh, in, in the Brotherhood. And I really, I, you have to just love it. I mean, when you're a journalist, life gives you few gifts like the ones we saw on the 21st and 22nd of November. On the 21st of November, you have this incredible story in the New York Times about how Barack Obama has established this level of great confidence and trust. And Mohammed Morsi, who has the, the mind of an engineer and the precision and the pragmatism. And of course, the next day, he assumes dictatorial powers by declaring that the... Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, the timing was, 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 was uh, delicious. So anyway, but the point is, this is the way the Muslim Brotherhood operates, and anyone who understands what the Brotherhood is about, I'll, I'll, I'll clean up in just one second, okay, could have seen this coming a long, long time ago. The conundrum is this, okay? This is the essence of the problem. If you want to have a democratic process in the Middle East, that is to say, one that represents most of the people, you have to have Islamist parties participate in that process. If you want to have a democratic outcome in the Middle East, you have to prevent Islamist parties from participating in the process because the first thing they're going to do is destroy the, the democracy. The conclusion is we're not going to have a democratic future in the Middle East, and we need to start thinking about some alternatives. Thank you. Can you ever suffer with dictatorial nostalgia? Well, now let's flesh this out a little bit. I'm, I'm not going to ask uh, Ruel to do any simple math uh, because we all know the answer. It will be fruit. Um, <laughs> uh, but l let me tease out a couple of, uh, of themes here. First of all, Brian, you mentioned that there's nothing uh, anti-democratic about Islam. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I'd like to hear a little bit from you and then perhaps from Rob. Uh, and I know we probably need to make some distinctions between Islam and Islamism, yeah. but I think this is an important theme here. Well, that was the first distinction I was trying to make, is that the religion itself, essentially, and you can see uh, around the world, you look at basic facts, uh, uh, the number of Muslims who are in the world, and uh, the fact that sometimes they organize politically and participate in a democratic system. There's nothing essentialist in terms of Islam and democracy being incompatible. I, I know some academics still debate it, but again, I think this is kind of a quaint uh, debate, and we have enough experience out there. And my own experience also living and working in the Middle East in the dark ages when democracy, before the, uh, the Bush administration, I think, put it higher on the agenda, but back in the 1990s, it was that there are, there's sort of a generational, a, a generation that's coming to fore right now, which is what we're seeing right now, that want a say and a voice in their political systems. And I mean, the last thing I, I'd say, I don't, I know you don't want me to go on here for long, but I was in Iraq early after the invasion and doing work on democratic political systems, um, trying to understand what Iraqis wanted. And they themselves didn't know what they uh, clearly wanted in their governments. But Islamism was at the forefront of it. And as we see the election results, while our troops were in Iraq at that time, you had political parties become uh, quite dominant um, in that uh, political system and even to this day. And that's sort of the point. I know you're going to have Ambassador Khalilzad talk about, but engaging these different forces, shaping them, I think is going to be the next stage. Uh, they're going to be part of the system. Uh, they can operate. And I'm not saying that Iraq is at all a democracy to these days, but there's, there is a potential, especially with this new generation, that doesn't want this ossified interpretation of even how the, today's Muslim Brotherhood leadership in Egypt views Islamism and politics. I'd, I'd, I'd actually disagree with my uh, partner here just a bit. Uh, I mean, in 1807, when the uh, British decided that the slave trade was a bad idea and they went to go and form the sublime port, and the Ottomans, by the way, were, had, you know, uh, the slave trade going into the Ottoman Empire dwarfed the North Atlantic slave trade coming to America. The, uh, the Ottomans responded as any sensible Muslim would have. They responded as any sensible American Southerner would have done in 1807. And they said, have you lost your mind? Because slavery is vouch, vouchsafed to us by God. Uh, that was part, slavery was part of the Islamic tradition as it had been part of the Christian tradition. It was not something, uh, it was very clear that the tenets of Islam allowed slavery. I think it's very clear that the tenets of classical Islam are non-democratic. The democracy is, is, is not in, it is a Western import. But the thing to remember is evolution. Uh, you will find very few Muslims outside of Sa Saudi Arabia today who believe that slavery is vouchsafed to them by God. There has been a successful alteration of the Islamic identity on that issue. I would just suggest that democracy is also one of those issues. Rob, has Islam evolved? Well, again, I, I'm sorry to, to slightly amend the question. Um, uh, uh, the, the question is really about Muslims, not about Islam. Just the same way the question is not about um, uh, Christianity or Judaism. It's about Christians and Jews. It's about how people act and organize themselves politically. Um, uh, you know. Um, Jews and Christians in, the, in the, the course of history have themselves had a, shall we say, rather checkered experience, not only with democracy in general, but self-government um, more specifically. I mean, uh, uh, those of us in the Jewish faith in, the, in this room know that uh, we screwed it up a couple of times, self-government, and now we're... Uh, um, Doing it again. And the Jews and... <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bit more generous <laughs> just to say that... There is a challenge underway. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so Muslims, Muslims are dealing with their uh, challenge, not just of self-government, but also of how you organize self-government and whether uh, democratic principles can be reconciled with traditional Muslim principles. Um, I totally agree with Brian in the sense that the vast majority of Muslims in the world today, in the 21st century, have figured out that yes, you can reconcile traditional Muslim principles with democratic principles. Um, uh, whether they, you know, how they do this, uh, successfully, unsuccessfully, but yes, they figured it out. Um, uh, does that mean that the tension has gone away? Absolutely not. And it is especially alive in that part of the Muslim world uh, where Arabic society, uh, culture, and civilization uh, dominates. 
Let me ask this question, and I think I heard this a few times. It was a sort of a theme, but there's this notion that once uh, Islamists come to power, that's how they discredit themselves and perhaps ultimately get saddled with the uh, mundane issues of, of uh, garbage collection and other things and ultimately uh, find themselves moderating. Is that an inevitability? Well, look, um, what I really, I didn't even get to the, the, the gravamen of my complaint with Ro. He didn't even make the best possible case he could make for his own side. And that case basically amounts to this. If we are going to achieve a future in which Muslim majority states have rid themselves of these infections, ideological infections of socialism, Islamism, Baathism, and so on, they, you know, there's no way out but through. They have to experience it for themselves. And the, the evidence of that is to look at what I would guess is 80% of Iranians who detest their regime, detest the Ayatollahs, detest this whole system that they have been living under for an entire generation. And now you have some, a, a, a majority of Iranians with no living memory of the Shah who would want nothing more than to get rid of this system, okay? Now, I'm not exactly sure that's, that's a kind of a very strained argument for saying we have to go through Islamism, we have to live through 30 years of tyranny and the, this threat to the world to, you know, to, to get out to the other side. Maybe that's true, we'll, you know, we'll... Uh, uh, I have made that argument. Okay, well, it's... it's I only had five minutes here. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so maybe that's an argument. But maybe the, where I don't see this to be the case is this notion that Islamists are going to come to power in, say, Egypt or uh, Palestinian Authority, and people are going to say, you know, they didn't collect the garbage as well as they had promised. And so in a way that may operate in Concord, Massachusetts, or Madison, Wisconsin, there's going to have, they're going to have an election, and some other party is going to come forward and say, we're going to do a better job of the mundane tasks of governance, because that's not what these Islamist parties are all about. I mean, the Ayatollah Khomeini said it very well when he said, in effect, we didn't have a revolution to bring down the price of melons, okay? They're not interested in these, in these mundane facts. There is no experience that I'm aware of, of an, and Rob pointed this out, of an Islamist government simply saying, you know what, um, time's up and you guys won and, and we're walking off the stage. And by the way, I don't think it's going to happen in Turkey either. Two fingers from I, I actually agree with Brett. I do not uh, find terribly compelling the arguments to say, uh, we're going to pick up the trash and we're going to moderate. The Muslim Brotherhood is about virtue. Uh, we have yet to see that really argued in Egypt, but I guarantee you it's right. coming. That's what you want to see coming. You want to see Muslims start having the organic debates that they were having around the year 1900 and got aborted by the arrival of dictatorship. You need to have them have the basic slugfest amongst people of faith and uh, to remind Rob of this, it's not going to be the liberals, the people who are essentially like us in the Middle East who are going to drive Al-Qaeda out. It's going to be people of faith who drive it out. The battle is amongst them. It's not amongst those who are essentially already us. Yeah, but I, I'm sorry, but Ru Ruel, you just cannot claim that people of faith equal the Islamists. Well, That's not fair. If you go to Egypt today, 80 some odd million people, nearly all of them will say that they are people of faith. And the Muslim Brotherhood, on the contrary, is a well-organized, well-disciplined party with only about six or 800,000 members and tentacles all around the country that organize and do all sorts of things well. But you cannot say that people of faith equal Islamist. Islamist they, is an ideology about achieving political power for a certain political goal, not virtue. It is people of faith, not liberals who win, who vote for the Muslim Brotherhood. When liberals, however you want to define them, and God knows it's a motley crew in Egypt, uh, whenever they win the election, you come back and talk to me. Yeah, I, I wanted to just add on the Egypt point, though, that I think uh, we all realize this, that we're at this very sensitive stage where there are multiple centers of power, not just the Muslim Brotherhood or the Islamists, but you do have liberal forces, and they're in the streets, they're using politics in the ballot box. And the point I was trying to stress, my last point, uh, 
is that I think the U.S. writ large, the government, and then also our civil society organizations and others, were largely standing on the sidelines here. And Rob's organization put out an excellent report last week. People should take a look at uh, my organization. We got to do this at think tanks with USIP. Did a private study along the same lines. Right now, I think U.S. policy, and again, U.S. government policy, but also those of you, I think, in civil society and others, we're sort of sitting on the sidelines here where there is a desire among a lot of political forces, including younger Islamists, who want to uh, uh, bring about change within their political movement. And we're, for, for the large part, I think, sitting on the sidelines here, and we need to do more. Okay, we, uh, we do need to uh, move on to the um, Q&A portion here. I'd like to take a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. We've got microphones circulating. We'll take about 10 minutes here before we begin to wrap up. Uh, yes, my name is the Shor King. Uh, my name is Ali Liami from the Center for Democracy and Human Rights in Saudi Arabia here in Washington, D.C. Uh, what's missing from these discussions, which I attend less and less, <laughs> is uh, the fact that Islamists have nothing to offer except the Sharia law. And Muslims are fed up with the Sharia law. The other point is there is a new generation of Arabs, the Facebook people, I wrote an article about this, who are very different than their fathers and grandfathers. What we should be focusing on, I can, think, can we is, get to a is, question? Is, excuse Sorry, me, Jim Mulsey, Jim Mulsey have said some, something that we should be focusing on. Our democracy are threatened by Islamist ideology, namely Wahhabism. What shall we do about the threat to democracy? Because Arabs are going to sort their problems out. This is the first time they are fo focusing on their own homegrown problems instead of bl blaming us and the Israelis and other people. What should we do about deadly ideology that is focusing on destruction of democracies? Would anybody like to take that one? Look, it begins by recognizing what it is. Um, a couple of years ago, before these, the Tahrir Square movement, there was a prominent article, I think it was in Foreign Affairs, about the moderate Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the term moderate is one of these very slippery terms because um, to us it means someone like us, right? But in reality, all it defines is a position in a given political context. There were moderate Nazis. Okay, Albert Speer was a moderate Nazi. But he was still a Nazi. Okay, there are shades of brothers and there are shades of Islamists and you'd probably consider the Brotherhood, even more extreme brothers, to be moderate next to less extreme Salafis. But as far as anyone in this room, I suspect, is concerned, these people are extremists. So we need to have some kind of right understanding of who these groups are and how inimical their values are to our own. We also have to have, so that's point one. Point two is something that Rob said in his, uh, in his uh, remarks, which is we need to respect who they are. Now, respect is not to endorse, on the contrary. Respect is to understand the gravity of what they're about. You know, they're not about a less corrupt delivery of social services. They are about virtue. The fundamental political distinction, going all the way back to the Greeks, is the question of are you a virtue-based society or a freedom-based society? The Islamic Republic in Iran, the new government in Egypt, all of them organize their political life on the basis of what they believe is virtue. At the heart of a virtue-based society is a totalitarian society, okay? Because it dictates your scope of action in life. It dictates fundamental moral choices about who you marry and whatever, all kinds of stuff, right? So that's another way in which we need to understand. And that also leads to some, ought to lead to some deeper appreciation of how you go about tackling this. Very briefly, we should distinguish the term liberalism from democracy. Okay, democracy is simply a process. 
It's just a pro it, you had an election. People can vote for their own enslavement and often do. People forget this. People think, oh, we're all for freedom. No, I'm sorry, but there is a, there is a constituency in the world that's pro-submission, okay? Th this is a kind of a psychosexual fact of life that isn't fully uh, uh, appreciated uh, uh, in, in, in the West. But so how do you go about it? You distinguish between democracy and liberalism, and you try as best as you can to promote the spirit of liberalism, even if it is procedurally at the expense of democracy. Brian, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Brian, do you have a response to that? No, I mean, I'm, I'm listening to this uh, discussion, which I enjoy thoroughly, but my mind goes to how, and how, how we do this, and drill home if there's one point. Um, that I'm trying to stress here is that I, I may agree or di I disagree with some of the things that Brett said, but the, the problem here in Washington is that I think you look at the democracy, freedom, and liberal uh, uh, promotion mechanisms that we have, they're ossified. They're actually not as nimble as they need to be. When I look at Benghazi, and yes, there are questions about the talking points and who said what, but the bigger policy debate we need to be having is how do we actually influence the next phase uh, Ambassador Chris Stevens, who was killed to honor his memory, we need more people who are speaking Arabic, who understand who are the types of different political forces we can work with and those that we actually need to kill. And right now the Washington debate isn't about that. Right now it's a little bit intellectual, it's narrow and focused sort of in a corner. Getting the facts straight I think is important, but right now we're not well poised on Egypt or on some of the other countries in the region, and I'm saying collectively, to actually have a role in shaping this. Firas Maksad from uh, DLA Piper, right behind. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me, let me say outright that I, I very much enjoyed the, the debate, the colorful debate, and uh, I hesitantly step into the family feud. But, but if I made two points, two very quick points, what I thought was missing, especially what I'd like to hear from Rob and Brett, perhaps, is if this path, as Rob put it, leads us down a road that will not lead to democracy in the Middle East, well, what is the alternative path? Because we certainly have tried the route of dictatorship and allying the United States with, with tyranny in the region, and, and that didn't work. So I'd like to hear more about that and hear your point of view. My second point is the Islamists. When we talk about the Islamists, we're sort of using a very broad brush here because there are many different types of Islamists in the region. Certainly Hezbollah shares very little with the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and watching how things are going in Egypt, and Egypt was mentioned quite a bit here because of its role in the region, the, the weight that it carries. Well, somebody who, somebody who considers himself a secular liberal uh, middle Arab, um, I'm not too upset about the way things are going in Egypt. I'm not too upset about having Mursi having to face millions of angry Egyptians in the street. Um, I sort of take note when they come to power and all of a sudden the treaty with Israel is not their number one priority when they're not banning alcohol in nightclubs for the sake of, of the economy and tourism. So when we talk about Islamists, I think we have to take note that some Islamists are different than others and some will naturally have to be more pragmatic if they're going to be in a position of power. I'll stop here. Rob, do you want to kick that one off? Well, let me, uh, let me unpack a couple of thoughts because um, uh, this is also connected to, uh, uh, I thought, a, um, a rather uh, another slippery aspect of uh, the argument made by uh, Ruel uh, a few moments ago. Um, if on the one hand, um, the, uh, uh, the is if on the one hand people of, uh, Isl uh, Islamists to equal people of faith, then um, everyone on the other side are liberals. Um, uh, I don't believe I ever used that term in anything I said. The opposite of Islamist is non-Islamist. There's a huge spectrum of people who are, you know, who will run into the streets because they are, um, you know, like that guy in Network, they're mad as hell as with what their life is going to be like under an Islamist rule. And they go from radical communists on one hand to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Western-oriented liberals on the other. And indeed, people of, many people of faith, millions of people of faith. Uh, Muslims, believing Muslims, five times a day praying Muslims, as opposed to many people who are the, uh, you know, the ham and cheese eating Muslims. They're all there. That's who our, um, the natural audience is. It's everyone who's opposed to the totalitarian agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood. And it's huge out there. 
And this is where I think uh, the friendly debate between my partner and I disagree. Um, uh, Brett and I disagree that I think um, in truly free and fair elections where there's a level playing field and the institutions of government are working, the non-Islamists will triumph. Now, um, uh, I, I have a very, in answer to Brian's oh, operational could suggestion. Could you explain Turkey on that one? Op operational question Brian had um, about how you, you know, what you do. I'm, I, a very simple, very simple answer. During the Cold War, say Afghanistan, we paid a price. We bit the bullet. The Cold War was the top priority, and we armed the Islamists to defeat our number one enemy. Yes, there were very negative results and results, but the goal is the end of the Cold War. And we won, and the Soviet Union is gone. <clears throat> Today, I don't mind giving money to communists and, le and leftists and socialists and helping them because I'm not worried about the return of the Cold War. I'm not worried about leftists coming to power. By God, that should be the biggest challenge that we face, right? We should not be indifferent to the outcome in Egypt and countries across the Middle East. We can both play a role in assuring a level playing field and in assisting those who we have an outcome in their success. We can do both. They are not antithetical. And that should be what our agenda is in these countries. Okay, we've got a few add-on comments, Ruel. Uh, I mean, I, I would agree w with a lot of what Rob said. I mean, I basically believe in intruding to know almost everybody's business. And uh, I certainly believe in unleashing uh, the agency, even though it doesn't want to be unleashed, uh, to support uh, covertly, because I think it's going to have to be covertly, because I don't think anybody's going to openly take our money, uh, but covertly supporting all the liberals and the motley crew that Rob uh, mentioned. Great. I'm all for it. Just throw as much cash as you can find uh, that we can get out of Washington, give it to them, hope they organize, hope they win. But the odds of them winning are poor. Uh, and as Rob didn't touch Turkey, Turkey, we, they had free elections. Uh, and there were lots of liberals, they were corrupt and all the rest, but still there were lots of them everywhere. More secularized Muslims than any place else, and guess what? They lost, and then they lost again. Uh, and they lost in free elections. So go ahead and do it. By all means, the United States should su use the bully pu pulpit, support liberals, support people of faith who are not Islamists amongst the Muslims. But be, be prepared that you're, that's, you're going to do that, and they're still going to lose. That they, you're going to have to have Islamists, I think, come into power, as we've seen, and you're going to have to have the great debates with them in power. Just very briefly. Um, I'm of two minds about supporting liberals, because when you go out to places like Cairo and Amman and you meet, quote, liberals, they tend to be nauseating. Um, <laughs> And their idea of liberalism is what they read in a Noam Chomsky uh, uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, so there's a real question, and I think Raul is, is right. We could be throwing a lot of money at buying laptop computers for, you know, the young liberal society of Alexandria, and, and it's, it's just, you know, money down the drain. Um, I'm always struck whenever I met, I mean, I remember having a meeting with uh, a deputy head of the Brotherhood, this was six or seven years ago, and uh, he turned out he had a, a degree from the University of Missouri, and obviously uh, Morsi has a degree from uh, Northridge or one of the... USC. Well, Cal, there you go. Uh, most of the Iranian leadership, uh, most of the early Iranian leadership had, had degrees from, from American universities. And the problem we face is quite fundamental, and there's no easy solution to this, which is that, uh, in effect, we here in the West have been trashing the good name of liberalism and pushing out a bogus garbage liberalism, which has been readily received and imbibed by uh, st uh, students from the Middle East coming to American universities and sucking up this stuff and then going back and starting a revolution. I mean, it's like Pol Pot. I mean, where does Pol Pot from, come from? Not Cambodia, it comes from the Sorbonne, obviously. You know, <laughs> Iranian revolution comes from ideas gleaned in the 1960s and 70s on, on Western universities. Now, this is a very fundamental problem, but I think it's just worth recognizing that until someone says, actually, liberalism as we define it is what you find in 
Locke's second treatise on government and the Federalist Papers and John Stuart Mill and de Tocqueville, all these, you know, mostly guys, I'm afraid. Um, uh, that's what liberalism is. Then you can start constructing an idea that can compete with Islamism. Because Islamism basically says, we stand for justice. Every Islamist party is the Justice and Development Party or the Justice and Freedom Party. It's justice this, justice that. Okay? How, do you, how, do you actually how do you offer a competing liberal vision in the Arab world that, that can stand up against that? I mean, I don't think we're really, we're thinking, you know, throw money at it or have some program or some covert action. We need to approach the issue in some sense philosophically. The reality is there's very little that we can do except hopefully protect the interests that we currently have um, in the region. But we can think for the next 30 or 40 years about how you create cadres of genuine liberals who may someday run their country. I mean, I grew up in Mexico very briefly. Mexico was this horrible, backward, authoritarian place with these loser presidents like Porti Lopez Portillo. And all of a sudden you get like guys like Cedillo and Fox and Calderon. And they all, where did they come from? They have a PhD from the University of Chicago. That's how it happened. It was like 10 guys. So that's how these things happen. Find those 10 people, educate them, and maybe some good of it will come 20 years down the road. You know, you mentioned the uh, justice component of a lot of these Islamist parties. There is an argument uh, that can be made that um, this is a response to the corruption uh, of these U.S.-sponsored regimes. And I would say that in the case of Gaza, which you mentioned, Rob, uh, that was a very serious component. Do you have any, any thoughts about how to combat that or, or how to influence this in, in the right direction? For the record, I am against corruption. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good, good. I wanted to clear that up. Um, uh, yes, look, um, it, is ab it, it goes back to the point I thought I made in my remarks that Islamists didn't win, the non-Islamists lost. Whether they were the former corrupt regimes or the, the divisions among the non-Islamist parties today, um, they lose. They lose by screwing up the delivery of, of, of services. They lose by being so corrupt. They lose by being ossified. They lose. Uh, and Islamists are there, like they've been for 80 years, waiting to, to take advantage of whatever opportunity, through violence or through nonviolence. We didn't even discuss the, um, uh, their, their relationship with violence and nonviolence, which is a very important issue. Um, uh, and they're there to, to, to you know, like, uh, like vultures, to reap the, the, the benefits of, uh, the, uh, to reap the carrion of, uh, of these regimes. Um, uh, we can build and we can help them help the alternatives build better alternatives. Okay, thank you. We have a question in the far corner over there. Yes, my name is Greg Aftandilian with the Center for National Policy. Uh, thank you for the uh, debate. Um, my, my point here is that um, there's been a suggestion by some of the panelists that once Islamists come to power via the ballot box, um, they won't give up power. And we're going to have a sort of renewed dictatorship types in the Middle East. But the events in Egypt over the past few weeks suggest that you have a, a new politicized class of people who are not going to take that. So I agree with one of the, the previous questioners that in some respects this is quite healthy, that um, you, you are going to have these deep um, debates and divisions within the, the Arab world or the Muslim world, and people are not going to accept dictatorships like they had in the past. So I was wondering if the panelists could comment on that. Thank you. I mean if I could say, I mean, this is the point I was trying to stress on my comments on Egypt in a report we put out about managing change in Egypt. There are these multiple centers of power that didn't exist under Mubarak. They're out in the open. They're competing through various means, in the streets, through the institutions, and other things. This is an early stage of the game. And uh, as Rob cited the, the last presidential sort of election results, there's this desire for different multiple centers of power, right? So the task here in Washington, and it's going to be very difficult to convince our U.S. government to change the way it's done business for 30 years because of a lot of the strategic and security imperatives that drive 
our decision making. And some of that is necessary. But the task is actually how do you actually play the right role of engaging here? And it's not naively giving money to liberal groups and, and things like this and not having a strategy. But I do believe that this is a, a significant test uh, inside of Egypt. I, it's an encouraging sign. And I think, this is my prediction and where Rob and uh, we may disagree, is that it's going to force uh, Islamist political parties like the FJP at least elements of it to change their ideology. If the system remains open, and that's the big if, if there's a big debate, and I don't, I don't see it going backwards in terms of the diversity, at least in Egypt, and as large as it is, it's hard for me to imagine um, that going backwards. Okay, we are going to uh, move to our closing remarks, and we're going to go in reverse order. So, Brett, you can have two minutes here to make your final plea to convince this audience uh, against the motion. Yeah, in 1979, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick uh, wrote an influential article in Commentary Magazine, Dictatorships and Double Standards, in which she argued what is now the, I guess, the paleo-neocon position I find myself increasingly attracted to, that the United States is better served supporting, if necessary, not always, but if necessary, secular authoritarian regimes against totalitarian alternatives. Now, totalitarian alternatives, then as now, often can come to power by means of democratic or populist movements. But just because they come to power that way doesn't mean they govern that way. And I think that's a distinction worth keeping alive in our minds today. You know, I'd love to imagine that now that the political space, all this blo you know, the, the, these terms that only in Washington are used, the political space has been open for new forms of competition. Baloney, okay? It's, it's the French Revolution. I mean, Jim Woolsey said it right at the first time. You start with the oath of the tennis court. You're now entering the terror stage. Let's pray for Thermidor. Um, uh, because we are, we are now seeing a process of the total, to, the, the, the process of totalitarianism coming into too many Middle Eastern, uh, um, Middle Eastern countries. It's important to recognize that for what it is. It's important to see you know, who these guys are. It's important not to deceive ourselves that you know, they come in all kinds of a rainbow variety of shades of Islamists. They don't, OK? It's black, gray, or very, very dark blue. Um, so that's what I would, I would urge people to, to, to think about. One last point, because my mind is on political philosophy. You know, the great, I've of course been saying we need to learn about Locke and, and, and uh, these guys, but um, Locke's second treatise of government comes out of a debate he has with this guy called Robert Filmer, who argues for monarchy. And uh, monarchy is looking better and better uh, uh, in, in the Middle East. If there's one country that seems to have figured it out, so far is Morocco, and maybe that should be a model for other places in the region as well. Okay, thank you, Brett. Uh, Brian. My basic argument for the proposition on our side of the debate is an argument for reality, of opening your eyes and seeing where we are today two years into these uprisings and these changes. And in uh, a, a region of the world just narrowly focused on the Middle East, which has about 20 countries, you have seen uh, political change, at least the leadership in four of them. In two of those countries, we've seen Islamist forces uh, come to power through the ballot box. In the two others, Islamist political parties are playing some sort of role, more, more marginal, in Libya. We're at the start of a process. And I think our response from Washington has been uh, very sort of philosophical and intellectual, but not very operational. I think this process is moving forward. Uh, when you look at the demographic, social, economic pressures that these societies face. In some of these countries, political Islamist forces will come to power. They will face competition from other non-Islamist forces. They will face competition from other Islamists. Politics is becoming much more complicated in the Middle East. And what worries me the most here in Washington, just down from the Capitol Hill, is, is that we ourselves don't have a functional political discourse about our own issues, let alone how do we respond in clear, strategic ways to these events in the region. I think the region is in for a long, longer period of time of change than, than, than Central and Eastern Europe um, uh, faced. And I also think that America plays an important role, should play an important role in this. But right now, 
I think our voice has been largely muted by our internal divisions, by some uh, ways that we do business in our government and outside of government that have ossified. And the, the main argument is it's upon us and more is coming, more change is coming. Some of that will include Islamist forces and we need to figure out how to best use our power uh, to shape and influence their, their, their trends. Okay, thank you very much. On to Rob and uh, extra bonus points if you can weave that ham and cheese eating Muslims line in there again. Uh, I was gonna do that. <laughs> um, a, a couple of closing points. Uh, first, um, we, I think collectively, maybe I'll just say myself, but I think generally we tend to project a certain uh, bigotry of low expectations on Muslims in the, um, uh, in the Arab cultural uh, world, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, those of us who are of various religious faiths here know the extent to which we practice our faiths and how faithful we are to this or that religious prescription. Um, and we know that we fall pretty darn short, but we think, ah, Muslims, they all pray five times a day. They all, they've never touched a scotch. Um, they all do, uh, you know, every, every commandment that is in, in Islam. And of course, they all submit to the, to the will of their local imam and their, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't work that way. Muslim praxis in general is, is not so far different than praxis here. And Muslims want to be political the way we want to be political. Let us not fall prey to the bigotry of, of low expectations that they can't make reasonable choices about their own political organization. And that therefore, if you fall prey to that, you will accept the, pro the, the proposition that, ah, Islamism, essential, unavoidable, inevitable, malarkey. It is not unavoidable. It is not inevitable. What in politics is unavoidable and inevitable? It's not the case. And it's certainly not essential that if we want to defeat the great ideology that Jim Woolsey spoke about this morning, if we want to defeat that great threat, it is certainly not essential that we embrace victory of people who have that ideology. Because then, what does that mean about us? It means that we are vanquished cowards in the face of that ideology. So, it is not essential. Let us try to defeat it peacefully if possible, through the means that we know, the ones that we've used in the past against other ideologies, and we know it works. And we can <coughs> find men and women in this part of the world who can be our partners to do that. Okay, last uh, but not least, Ruel. You know, I actually thought Rob was sort of making my argument for me until the very end there. Did you know your writing's a bit psychopathic? <laughs> Uh, I, I strongly, uh, I strongly recommend uh, that uh, uh, you read Gene Kirkpatrick's uh, Dictatorships and Double Standards. Then I also recommend that you read my good friend Bob Kagan's Demolition of that, uh, of that essay later in commentary. Uh, I would just say this. I mean, I'm an Azawahiri knows what he's talking about when he says that democracy is a cancer. And it's spreading through the Muslim body politic and that it is perhaps the number one thing they fear. Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi in Iran knows what he says is that we've got to kill off democracy because in Iran where they have a fraudulent democratic system, the process of actually going out to vote created the earthquake in 1997 and created the even greater earthquake in 2009. There is not a single cleric, single first-rate cleric in Iran, with the exception of Ms. Bahiazdi, who will argue against democracy now. He is the only one. I, I do not have enough time here to explain, to name all of the individuals who were diehard revolutionaries, diehard anti-American Islamists in Iran, who have fallen away because of the practices of the theocracy. Now, we don't know what the evolution will be under a democratic system as opposed to a dictatorship. But under a dictatorship, we have seen a complete falling away of the intellectual class 
towards the democratic ethic. If, if there had been a free election in 2009, we would not have to worry about Iran today. We would not have to worry about the nuke. I suggest to you that the jousting ethic of a democratic process will give you a better chance of evolution than you've seen under dictatorship, and we might not have to wait that long for, to, to see that evolution happen. But there wasn't a free election. No, there wasn't. But e even on not having a free election, you had enormous evolution occur amongst people who were at one time diehard revolutionaries and Islamists. I suggest that evolution will be greater uh, under a democratic system or where you just have uh, um, uh, uh, as much voting as you've had in Iran. Okay. Well, we're going to have to leave it here. Please give a round of applause to our panelists. It's true. It's Ambassador uh, Zalman.